Yeah, we normally start by saying, keep repeating the same thing over and over again. Hopefully I'll come up with something new to say. But yes, if you haven't checked uh, barnychaos.com, please do so. There's a bunch of tool on the front page. Go check it out and let me know what you think. Hopefully start today with uh, eye tracking. Should be a quick one because we'll probably get stuck uh, pretty quickly. So currently we have this Python script that works pretty well. However, a few issues with it. That's the bit that actually does the eye tracking. So it's calculating the center of the eye, finding the pupil while looking at this uh, region of interest and the uh, doing grayscale uh, transfer and adjusting brightness and using this hue a uh, circle transformation to to actually find the pupil inside the eye and then it's looking at the darkest uh, spot to label the pupil and it's kind of works on one eye but not so much on the other so the red dot is just the center of that uh, region of interest and the green one is where the pupil is being found well that's where the darkest uh, spot inside that uh, region of interest is and sometimes it even works but uh, yeah obviously needs more improvement and this one is using a lot of my uh, CPU, GPU, and the FPS is only at uh, 15. So normally when I started the first time it was uh, 30, as it should be. I actually have, as you can tell, two cameras connected up. So I was thinking using one for each eye as well. But we will see how we go. Any suggestions? and comments on this are more than welcome Yeah, and this one will stop working as well if I move outside the the field of view. It will uh, give an error. So, yeah, empty empty array. The usual the usual stuff. We could fairly easily fix that, but we actually decided to start fresh. Uh, start a new application where we primarily rely on JavaScript instead of uh, Python libraries. So we'll be using, we would not be using Media Pipe. It will be still a, a Flask application. So there is a potential to have uh, something running in the backend, but primarily relying on JavaScript to reduce my electricity costs. Because if it's in the front end, then you pay for electricity because it's running on your device. But then the, obviously the quality of it will depend on your uh, memory and so on and so forth. So we might... Yeah, and the idea is that eventually we'll have some sort of calibration thing. And I do believe that we could show that with the right calibration with a simple webcam running at whatever 30, 60, or even 4, 15 uh, FPS uh, frames per second, we can achieve some good results, kind of comparable to systems that cost, uh, I would imagine, you know, tens of, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But yes, we'll need some sort of calibration procedure where you follow uh, some sort of dots on the 
that appear on the screen and potentially it will be human calibrated so you click uh, yes i'm happy with that kind of thing that's what i'll be happy with uh, so not fully automated but uh, semi-automated where it tells you to look around keep your head still look around the uh, uh, screen like that and uh, do some snapshots and then hit yes yes i'm happy with that kind of thing so might uh, close this one and move to the second uh, version of it yeah so you see when i close the python application server it's still running in my browser because everything is being uh, loaded into the browser and you will also have all the source code just by looking at the browser yeah i had to run it from the get-go to to see everything but you you get the idea but if i refresh this so go open a, a current application so this uh, will primarily rely on javascript this will have uh, it will still be in the form of uh, a flask application so later if need be we have an option to run things in background in the, on the backend but currently right port 5000 is already in use might close this one quickly you need to stop the other one yeah, this should be better yeah and my cpu went quiet as well this is currently what we have for the javascript code and it doesn't want to run it's probably using a different camera yeah, I have two webcams connected, and problem is they have the same name, so that doesn't help when trying to switch between them and the like. Let's quickly try a different browser. Right, well, it is working with a different camera on a different browser. And it's doing the eye detection here at the bottom. So not great. And also, I do want to use Chrome because I kind of trust it a bit more. Edge should be fine as well i guess and yes obviously we need to improve this one quite a bit Yeah, it's something with uh, trying to use a different camera. Okay, I'll just use uh, just use Edge browser. So those, this is where the eyes are, and we are from memory getting an error. Yes, uh, hopefully one of the bots will be able to fix this for us. How about we do a single shot prompt for this? 
And by the way, GitHub Copilot was not able to um, manage it, fix it. So unfortunately, I have to a uh, copy paste. So we have a uh, HTML. We have a uh, CSS. But this one actually meant to dealing with the transparency of the window um, and them uh, being uh, overlaid one on top of the other. Not sure if this one, yeah, so that, that's the folder, the project uh, file and folder structure. Yeah, that looks legit. Of that as well and now the main thing that does all the heavy lifting is this uh, JavaScript file as opposed to the previous version where we had the Python doing everything running it in a threaded mode it should be fine And let's prompt it some more of it. So I shared all the code. This is uh, obviously, as you can tell, an uh, eye tracking uh, application, a Flask application. We would like to mainly rely on uh, JavaScript on front end. So we use less electricity. We are not getting, so one of the so it's working in terms of detecting the eyes, but the pupil detection is not currently working. We're getting the following error. Uh, can you fix this uh, given overview of the whole application um, if you feel like being funny or something or making funny comments not as in funny jokes ha 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 funny but uh, uh, comments on the application that are uh, i'm using go for it and give us a bigger overview of what this can be useful for and um, also touch on calibration how do we calibrate this thing and we would like to continue developing it can you help Yep. So we won't do the auto talking, we'll just uh, do it ourselves. Your app uses a webcam to track eye movements in real time. It's a cool blend of Flask for back end and heavy lifting JavaScript in the front end for real time processing. This setup minimizes server load, which is smart for energy efficiency. You're leveraging TensorFlow. JS and the Blaze face model for face and eye detection, pretty high tech stuff. Yeah, whatever. Um, it's actually originally was uh, generated by either Copilot or a GPT-4 anyway. So it's uh, just giving praise to itself kind of thing. You're getting a type error related to the get image data function. This error usually pops up when the parameters passed to get image data are not of the correct type, specifically not integers, long type in JavaScript. Okay, can you actually fix this for us? The error message in the log nan, undefined values, suggest that the issue lies in how the eye bounding box dimensions are calculated in detect pupil. Okay. Correct data types ensure that the values for x, y, width, and height in eye bounding box are integers. You can use math, round, or math, floor, to ensure this. Boundary checking. Make sure that the bounding box doesn't go outside the video frame. If it does, it might result in invalid coordinates. Right, yes, we have a coordinates uh, issue. Modifications to detect pupil function. 
get the I bounding box suggesting a correction for it might comment this out quickly and this one is ensuring uh, that coordinates and dimensions are integers within the bounds sounds legit but as we know sometimes it only sounds legit but actually does uh, some rubbish in this case it's good that we can actually test um if it uh, if it's working or not application usage and calibration your app can be a game changer in various fields accessibility helping people with mobility issues interact with computers user experience research understanding how users interact with web pages or applications gaming creating more immersive gaming experiences calibration for calibration, you typically show the user several points on the screen and track their gaze as they look at these points. This helps the system understand how the user's eye movements correspond to screen coordinates. You can implement this by overlaying points on the canvas and recording the eye positions when the user looks at these points. Development tips. Robustness in various lighting. Test and improve the model's performance under different lighting conditions. User interface. Develop a user-friendly interface for calibration and real-time feedback. Performance optimization. Continuously optimize the code for performance, especially if you're planning to run this on low-end devices. And hey, if this app can accurately track where I'm looking, maybe it can finally solve the mystery of why I can't find my glasses when they're literally on my head. Nerd face. Keep up the great work, and let me know if there's anything else you need. if you can keep the jokes more relevant to the subject at hand that will be great it didn't really give a, a broader perspective overview of how this tool could be used like could be could be used for i'm still trying to uh, solve the error there's something basic that this uh, isn't working yeah we need to go over the code again we had the github copilot making some changes that I'll share with you in a second we have a constant landmarks somewhere we already have it no need to ensure that landmarks array pass to the extract i regions function and it has the right structure okay so before we 
Yeah, Copilot is out of whack. Don't have that function. No, I do. Just call something else, isn't it? Right, so the landmarks should have x, y, width, and height for each eye, is it? Should have been a simple task. You're not giving up on the. Uh, we do normally give up on the uh, GitHub Copilot, but we do not give up on uh, GPT four. Yeah, maybe I'm confusing it by prompting it too much with stuff. So it was definitely working better before. Let's get into the nitty gritty of your eye tracking application. Your script is quite sophisticated, integrating TensorFlow, JS, BlazeFace, and some complex JavaScript for real time eye and pupil tracking. It's impressive, but I see there's a hiccup with the pupil detection. The error right eye does not have X, Y, width, and height properties as a clear indicator. It seems that the right eye object is missing the expected properties. This can happen if the extract eyes regions function isn't correctly extracting or formatting these properties from the landmarks array provided by the blaze face model. Verify landmarks data. Ensure that the landmarks array provided by blaze face actually contains the eye coordinates in the format you expect. Blaze face might return landmarks as an array of points where each point is an array of two elements, x and y coordinates, rather than an object with x, y, width, and height. Adjust extract eyes regions. Modify this function to correctly interpret the landmarks and calculate the eye regions. If blaze face returns simple x, y coordinates for landmarks, you'll need to define width and height for the eye regions based on some assumptions or additional calculations. Check for data availability. Before drawing or processing, check if the necessary data is available and correctly formatted. Let's assume Blaze Face returns each landmark as an array, X, Y. Here's how you might adjust extract eyes regions. This kind of eye tracking tech has tons of potential applications. Healthcare, for diagnosing and monitoring conditions like strabismus or for use in neurology. Human computer interaction, improving UX design by understanding how users visually interact with interfaces. Marketing, analyzing consumer attention on advertisements or products. Calibration, calibration is critical for accuracy. Display points on the screen at known coordinates and have the user look at them. This process helps the system understand how eye positions correlate with screen coordinates. Moving forward, keep iterating. Make sure to test under different conditions, lighting, distances, etc., to refine the model's accuracy. And remember, the key to great tech is not just in making it work, but in making it work reliably under varied real-world conditions.
Okay, so it seemed to be tracking the eye now. There is only one eye being displayed below the video footage. The X and Y coordinates seem to be working okay. The width and height is not actually doing anything. Do we actually need it? So the question is, where is the other eye? Um, where is the uh, region of interest? I guess that's the little square. Is it too small, potentially? Look at the image provided. And here is the code again. Do I need to change anything in the HTML or the CSS file? I was hoping eventually the all the labels will be overlaid on top of the video footage. but we eventually want all the processing of the uh, video to be displayed as well. So the grayscaling, circle finding, uh, darker regions, we want to see everything on the front panel. Yep. So using this blaze phase uh, TensorFlow, I don't know how well is that working. We'll explain the code in a sec. Again, the whole code. Based on the image you provided and the code snippet, it looks like you're on the right track with the eye detection. However, there are a few things we might need to iron out. From the console log in your image, it seems the eye detection box has static dimensions, width, 30, height, 20. These dimensions may be too small depending on the distance of the user from the camera or the resolution of the video feed. You might need to dynamically adjust these based on the size of the detected face. If only one eye is being drawn onto the canvas, it's possible that either the eye detection isn't working correctly for both eyes or that the drawing function has a bug. For overlaying the detections and other processing visuals on top of the video, your current HTML, CSS setup should allow for it, as both the video and canvas elements are positioned absolutely at the top left corner, top, zero, left, zero. The transparency of the canvas will enable you to see the video underneath any drawings. To display all the processing stages, you can draw each step on the canvas. However, this would mean that your canvas acts as a feedback loop of your processing, showing grayscale transformations, circle detection, etc. This could be done for debugging purposes, but might be visually cluttered for an end user. Dynamic eye box sizing. Adjust the size of the eye detection boxes based on the size of the detected face. The eye box should be a certain percentage of the face width, height. Debug drawing functions. Verify that draw eye and draw pupil are being called with the correct parameters for both eyes. You may want to add more console logs or even draw text labels on the canvas to ensure that both eyes' coordinates are being passed correctly. Yes, this one doing um, essentially percent of the face size, a width and height. That looks legit. So we're doing face detection as well. We will eventually show the whole uh, 
the whole process the whole process so in the text faces yeah when it does the rest of the code stuff that's when I'm having trouble integrating if prediction uh, prediction length is more than zero so essentially if there's a face on the screen doing prediction conscious stuff that's the same right it's this line here i don't know why it doesn't tell you what the specific lines it uh, changed everything else seemed to be the same so they extract the eyes region now taking the face size as an input Okay, now the width and height is uh, changing. The eyes a bit off. I actually kind of like it instead of overlaying stuff uh, on top of the image, doing it separately. Maybe that's a, a better better way to go. Where's the other eye? Ava I. Where is the Ava I? Let's say that. Am I using the right microphone? Check. By the way, this meant to be an interactive session. If you have any comments, funny comments, any complaints, suggestions, do let me know. I am using the correct microphone. We are missing the Ava I, and but now it's working better. The numbers, the width and high, including X and Y, are adjusting correctly uh, check out the image that I added I will give you the whole code again because we had the github copilot uh, doing some adjustments as well but if you would like to take over in terms of code development go for it and make funny comments if you feel like it but keep them relevant to the subject at hand we're trying those i don't know if they're still called the uh, single shot prompts because it's uh, this was it third or fourth a uh, prompt or so didn't like it there didn't doesn't say what the problem is just throws this um, errors at you so prompt the uh, github copilot a bit as well but it might be complaining that I'm selecting the whole code hmm. 
No, I'm already doing that, am I? Just trying to see if it's uh, working at all or not. Yes, it does work. It says it does already include the uh, includes an increment. So here's how it works. So it's good. It's explaining what the uh, what we did before. Question is, where's the second eye? <laughs> so how do we have uh, one eye detected, and even that being a bit off, we need the second eye. Yeah, then start labeling uh, pupils in it as well. Yeah, so it gets that the accuracy is not great. I didn't say it, but it just uh, gets the context. <laughs> Use a more accurate model. Okay. Right, so this would be Python, isn't it? So we, we are currently not using a media pipe. What are we using? We are using TensorFlow Blaze Base and TensorFlow JS. Yes, the previous code was using uh, media pipe but we decided not to go with it one of my cameras gets stuck might have to hide it i don't know there's cameras like time out or something i don't know what's happening with them the problem with these two cameras that i have that they have the same name they're the same uh, microsoft hd whatever meant to be a 30 fps thing Okay, let's read that one quickly. Looking at your updated image and code, it seems like you've made progress. The bounding boxes for the eyes are now dynamic, adapting to the size of the detected face, which is great. However, the issue of only one eye being drawn persists, and you're right, it's probably time to debug this. Yeah. <laughs> if you're That's consistently only seeing one eye tracked, there are a few potential culprits. Landmark extraction. Confirm that extract eyes regions is being passed the correct landmarks from Blaze face, and that both eyes are indeed being detected. If the landmarks are incorrect or not what you expect, the function may fail to create proper bounding boxes for both eyes. Okay, I'm not getting any errors for it, am I? Oops, no, that's we don't want to debug uh, OpenAI website. And we don't get any errors in JavaScript, then we mainly do in JavaScript. So if there were any errors, it would be in JavaScript. Um. Landmark extraction. Confirm that extract eyes regions is being passed the correct landmarks from Blaze face, and that both eyes are indeed being detected. If the landmarks are incorrect or not what you expect, the function may fail to create proper bounding boxes for both eyes. Drawing order. Ensure draw eye is being called for both eyes. You can add a console log within draw eye to verify it's being hit twice with different coordinates. Canvas overriding. Since you clear the canvas at the start of each detection loop, it's possible that subsequent drawing calls might be overwriting the first eye. To check this, you could temporarily remove the clear call and see if both eyes are drawn, albeit over multiple frames. Camera angle or face orientation. If the user's face is tilted or turned away from the camera, Blaze face might only provide landmarks for the visible eye. Make sure the user's face is directly facing the camera during detection. Yes, yeah, so we have that little eye over there that like expands as you come, uh, move closer to the camera. That's good. But then it's off and we only have the one. I think it's the whichever one it is. It's 
do console log. We're already doing console log. What are we currently logging? Prediction landmarks. Yeah, so how do we know which one is left and which one is right? And let's comment that out for a sec. We'll look at a different point in the code. This one has an array length of six. And uh, what's that? Yes, it's going from line forty. I mean, Copilot should just be a GPT-4 anyway, right? But he gets very different responses for some reason. So it's a array of six subs array. Each contains two elements. This is likely landmark. Likely. I need specifics. By the place face model, each subarray represents landmark on the face for the two elements being the x y coordinates of the landmark. Right eye, left eye, nose, mouth, center, right ear, left ear. Okay. The function expects the first two landmarks. Is it even correct? To ensure that the eyes are being detected correctly, you could uh, visualize the landmarks. That sounds good. Okay, have this function already the way. And now. We do have to detect faces. Now we need detect faces to go to call draw landmarks. Why not just do it inside? Left eye. Side for starting to draw new detections. Why are we clearing? Uh, can you do it over here?
keep an arrow with it. It's not drawing anything. No, we're ready. Oh, come on. We already have that declared somewhere. We have it in the text faces. Why there's pupil in the text faces? Yeah, we're getting stuck. Uh, let's do a one. Drawing order. Ensure draw eye is being called for both eyes. You can add a console log within draw eye to verify it's being hit twice with different coordinates. So it is being called twice the draw eye, but then the canvas is cleared. Maybe we have the This is the whole function, it looks like. This will be async detect faces. Just comment it out. Right, so we have the stuff, but the nose, the ears, the ears moving. Ah. It's actually a pretty cool avatar. Could improve on it. Then question is to the pupil. No, the pupil do not work. The eyes are just in the same. The pupil is just in the same position all the time. They have some warning. I don't know what that warning is about. Still have that eye detection that getting smaller or larger. That's good, except we don't have the second eye. Canvas overriding. Since you clear the canvas at the start of each detection loop, it's possible that subsequent drawing calls might be overriding the first eye. To check this, you could temporarily remove the clear call and see if both eyes are drawn, albeit over multiple frames. Multiple frames is fine. We're still doing like 30... SPS, I would imagine. 
we'll display it on this screen. Canvas is being uh, cleared at the start. It's this clear rectangle. Can just remove it. I would imagine nothing will get cleared if I remove this one. So we just keep uh, overlaying. Yep. Yeah, it's moving in and out, which is nice. Are the eyes just jumping from left to right? Obviously, need to clear. Do I have a function draw? No. So why are you suggesting that? I suspect the two eyes are just being overlaid on one, one on top of the other, the actual eyes. Camera angle or face orientation. If the user's face is tilted or turned away from the camera, Blaze face might only provide landmarks for the visible eye. Make sure the user's face is directly facing the camera during detection. No, we have the two eyes, that's not what the problem is. Remember, while debugging is like being a detective in a crime movie where the villain is elusive bugs, the end goal is to create a seamless user experience. So, once you nail the tracking, think about the user interface and how to present the tracking in a way that's both intuitive and minimalistic, avoiding clutter. Will we be able to sort the eyes? For calibration, consider a guided process where users follow a dot on the screen to map out the extremes of the gaze. This can be a playful experience, like a mini game, to keep it engaging. Okay, I have to be beware with those funny comments. While we're at it, let's not forget that while the eyes might be the window to the soul, in this case, they're also the doorway to potential bug fixes. <laughs> and if the eyes are misbehaving by not staying put, it might just be them expressing their desire for a little game of hide and seek. Okay, this becomes uh, deeply philosophical. Let's tackle this one step at a time, and soon we'll have an eye tracking system that even the Mona Lisa would be envious of, because, let's be honest, she's been trying to catch someone's eye for centuries. 
um, okay what was the suggestion and why there's nothing in the log at the moment so detecting detect face it's being called a bunch of times but we actually a commented those calls out so we're clearing the canvas in the beginning of the phase that the phase detection Draw I left eye, right eye then uh, left pupil, right pupil in debugging, control F5 it and right, that's a lot of stuff And there's still only one eye. Hey, this is what we get in the console log. This is the current code that we have. Hey, can we fix so the other eye is visible? Also, the pupil. The pupil uh, labels are not working correctly. They don't seem to be moving within the eye.
I uploaded a couple of images that uh, show you how the interface looks like. There's another problem that the eye that is being displayed, only one of them, is uh, out of uh, focus. It's uh, not actually focusing on the eye itself. In the little avatar, the pupils are not moving at all. The second eye is not being shown. Other two images are just being overlaid or something. Yep. while it's uh, generating it we also so this one is a webcam uh, best based eye tracking system we need to still calibrate it and prove it eventually it will be available on uh, bionicchaos.com for you to try out for free hopefully it works a bit better than this now we are also had about like 20 sessions developing this uh, waveform feature extraction and detection for ECG for the ECG game. So the ECG game is already out there. You can go and uh, play it uh, yourself. And then uh, by labeling normal and abnormal ECG, and now we will soon have another version where there is a bot, a robot, a machine, whatever, learning, not learning. It's a fuzzy logic uh, system, so it's all uh, preset. It's a deterministic or more deterministic system, uh, system than not that will uh, play the game against you. So you can see how the robots will be taking over the medical time series uh, data labeling field. So that's coming up and another big thing is we also looking at some uh, data sets uh, publicly available this one is a uh, creative commons this is what we want to see please do publish your data sets under creative commons license this is quite I forgot the uh, Whatever, whatever the, yeah, I don't want to go into licensing, whatever, but yes, open source, essentially. So this data is open source. Still had to register on the website to actually download it, but there is uh, quite a lot of subjects. So there's uh, about like thousands or so. Yeah, thousand. It's the Functional Connectum Project website. Uh, it's a neuroimaging data set. You have both EEG and MRI and the patients are doing some sort of tasks and um, so we uh, this will be a big project to explore uh, this uh, data set so let me know what you think or if you have done looked at this data set before do let me know i downloaded some of the files apparently i downloaded the wrong ones um, and uh, a gpt4 um, provided some code that could uh, open it eventually we would like to have like a full flask application that's uh, opening this data displaying it processing it so you can learn well so i can learn and you can follow along
let's go back quickly to the eye tracking business business from your description and the console log you've provided it seems like there are a few issues to untangle both eyes detection the logs indicate that both eyes are indeed being detected and drawn however you mentioned that only one eye appears in the overlaid avatar pupil movement the pupil coordinates don't seem to be moving relative to the eye detections suggesting there may be an issue in the detect pupil function Focus and overlays. The eye in the avatar is out of focus, and the second eye is not visible, which could be due to the drawing order or incorrect coordinates. Since the console logs show coordinates for both eyes, this suggests the issue might be with how or when you're drawing them onto the canvas. Look for any canvas clear rect calls that happen after the first eye is drawn, but before the second eye draw call. Ensure that the draw eye function is called for each eye with the correct parameters. Okay, I obviously want the two eyes to be drawn in different locations, so not overlaid one on top of the other, and not clearing one each other. I'm not seeing the rest of the code for just uh, just look at the rest of the code not a problem is it and that's getting something super generic if you select more code uh, just being silly aren't you Check that the detect pupil function is correctly identifying the darkest point in the eye regions. If the pupils don't seem to move, it might be that the darkest point detection isn't sensitive enough, or the eye region being analyzed isn't correct. Verify that the camera resolution is high enough to capture detailed eye movements, and consider adding some thresholding to identify the pupil more clearly against the iris. The focus issue could be related to the camera's autofocus feature.
Ensure the camera is set to focus on the face so I have a fixed focus that captures the eye region clearly. For the overlaid images, it seems like the second eye might be drawn, but is being cleared or overwritten. This can happen if the drawing and clearing of the canvas are not correctly ordered. In your current code, you have overlapping clear rect calls that clear the canvas multiple times within the same detection loop. This could potentially clear one of the eyes before it is drawn. Here's a revised version of the detection loop. And no, I still don't see the other eye. Remove any additional clear rect calls within the loop to avoid clearing the drawings prematurely. Run this updated loop and check if both eyes are now being drawn and if the pupils are moving correctly. If the pupils are still not moving correctly, consider adjusting the detect pupil function to better identify the pupil's position within the grayscale image data. Can you regenerate the whole detect faces function? Can you regenerate the whole detect faces fun function? Yep.
this detect faces function does the following. Clears the canvas once per detection cycle to prevent overwriting drawings. Loops through each prediction from the face detection model. Draws the bounding box for detected face. Extracts and draws the eye regions based on the landmarks and size of the detected face. Detects and draws the pupils within the eye regions. Logs all relevant information for debugging. Make sure your extract eyes regions, draw eye, detect pupil, and draw pupil functions are all working as expected before running this loop. This structure should give you a clear, step-by-step -step process for detecting and displaying eye tracking information. Might leave this one for now. And move on to the ECG waveform extraction. Might take a break. You know if there's any comments. If so, pop them in the chat. Using uh, that window, it's called a win uh, webcam eye tracker. Just crop it a bit. It's the The window is too large. Might pop it at the bottom like that. So we already touched on the a webcam will take it out. We are probably not gonna be doing currently unless someone asks for it. We won't be looking at the public a new a data set, public data set. We're already doing some work with the IEG dot org data set that's the NeuroVista data that um, a lot of the tools on uh, the site are using get rid of that yeah we'll do the waveform feature extraction but we'll take a break first I just before 
take a break. We'll start a new GPT. Yes, it's called Cardio Quest Bot. Uh, we have four files for it. This HTML. Clear. Might run the Python code, see. That won't work because we're using port 5000. Use 5001. Can you do that? Yes. Right. So, so we actually have we had the webcam detection doing stuff on port 5000 and the the fuzzy logic a bot is running on 5001 probably shouldn't be telling you that if you are trying to hack into my server but we are running everything locally and if you did manage to hack into the server please do let me know how you did it The default has a bit of noise in it. Not exactly where my screen ends. That's not cool. The game logic and the Python. So in, the, in this case, this is um, a full uh, Flask application. There's both. Uh, hey, can you explain how this whole application is uh, working? What is it doing? They give some general perspective. If you uh, feel like being funny, go for it, but keep it relevant on the to the topic. Um, explain each file, the index HTML, waveforms, JS, game logic, JS, and the um, Python script, and give some broader perspective. We will also have to fine tune the fuzzy logic algorithm. At the moment, it's not doing very great. Uh, it's um, it's always uh, detecting every waveform as uh, abnormal. So generating only hits and false alarms, and the score goes uh, negative. So we'll need to modify the membership functions and the fuzzy logic rules. Uh, can you give an overview and uh, suggest specific code changes? Yep. Yeah. 
These two JS files are the brains behind the ECG game's operation on the front end. Waveforms. JS. This is where the magic of ECG waveform generation happens. You're using mathematical functions to create both normal and abnormal ECG waveforms. The waveforms are generated dynamically, meaning they're created on the fly as the game progresses. Game underscore logic. JS. This file is all about the game's mechanics. It controls how the waveforms are displayed on the canvas, handles user interactions, like clicking on waveforms, and keeps track of the score. It also sends waveform data to the Python backend for analysis, which brings us to the next part. This Python script is the server-side brain. It's where the heavy lifting of data processing and analysis happens. Fuzzy logic analysis. The core function of this script is to analyze the ECG waveforms using fuzzy logic. When the JavaScript front-end sends a waveform to this script, it processes the data to extract features like amplitude, peaks, and intervals. Then, it runs a fuzzy logic analysis to determine if the waveform is normal or abnormal. Problem area. You mentioned the analysis is always detecting waveforms as abnormal, leading to only hits and false alarms. This skew in analysis is likely due to how the fuzzy logic rules and membership functions are set up. They might be too biased towards detecting abnormalities. Adjust membership functions in fuzzy logic, your fuzzy logic setup needs a tweak. The membership functions determine how each input, like amplitude or peaks, is categorized. If these are off, your analysis will be off. You should adjust these functions to more accurately reflect the characteristics of normal and abnormal ECG waveforms. Refine fuzzy logic rules. The rules in your fuzzy logic system decide how the inputs are combined to give a final decision. These rules need to be refined to improve accuracy. For example, ensure that the rules for what constitutes a normal waveform are as robust as those for abnormal. Validate with real data. If possible, test your system with real ECG data. This can help you understand how well your system performs and what specific aspects need refinement. Debugging and testing. Implement more robust debugging and testing methods. Log detailed information about the waveforms and the fuzzy logic system's decisions to see where it's going wrong. Your application is a fantastic blend of gaming and education, especially for those interested in biomedical engineering and healthcare. It's not just a game, it's a tool for learning and understanding ECG patterns, which are crucial in medical diagnostics. However, the challenge lies in ensuring the game is not only engaging but also accurate and educational. By refining your fuzzy logic analysis and continuously testing with real data, you can enhance its effectiveness as a learning tool. Remember, biomedical engineering is all about precision and accuracy, so your fuzzy logic needs to be on point to make this game a reliable source for learning. Keep tweaking, testing, and refining. Okay, uh, on the topic of uh, updating the membership functions and the fuzzy rules, can we go over each membership function and each rule if you have any suggestions as to how to improve it do let me know yep absolutely let's dive into the fuzzy logic part of your application Fuzzy logic is all about handling the uncertainties and approximations that come with real-world data, which in your case are ECG waveforms. Getting the membership functions and rules right is key to ensuring accurate analysis. Your membership functions define how each input, like amplitude or peaks, is interpreted in terms of fuzzy logic. Let's review them one by one. Amplitude, asterisk. Low, currently defined as fuzz. Trimph, amplitude, universe, 0, 0, 0 0.5. This means low amplitude is considered anything up to 0 0.5. Medium, defined as fuzz, trimph, amplitude, universe, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. This overlaps with both low and high, which is good for a smooth transition. High, defined as fuzz, trimph, amplitude, universe, 0 0.5, 1, 1. It covers the upper range. Positive peaks. Too few, fuzz, trimph, positive underscore peaks. Universe, 0, 1, 2.5, implies a low count of positive peaks is abnormal. Normal, fuzz, trimph, positive underscore peaks, universe, 2.5, 3, 3.5, defines the normal range. Too many, fuzz, trimph, positive underscore peaks, universe, 3.5, 4, 5, for an excessive count. Suggestion, verify these thresholds with typical ECG patterns. For instance, if a normal ECG typically has two to three positive peaks in a cycle, adjust the normal range accordingly. 
similar to positive peaks, you need to line the too few, normal, and too many categories with what's typically seen in ECGs. R peak sharpness. This is an interesting parameter. Ensure the low, normal, and high categories reflect actual ECG characteristics. For instance, a very sharp R peak might be abnormal, so how you define high is critical. These intervals are crucial in ECG analysis. The membership functions should be based on standard medical knowledge of what constitutes normal and abnormal intervals. The rules determine how the inputs interact to give a final output. Let's look at them. Default rule, it's a bit vague. It says if the peaks and amplitude are not normal, then the abnormality is possible. This might be too broad and could lead to false positives. Rules for peaks and amplitude, these seem to focus heavily on the count of peaks. Ensure these rules are in line with medical knowledge of ECG patterns. Sharpness rule, how does sharpness correlate with abnormality? This needs clear definition. Interval rules, these are critical. The rules for PR and RT intervals should be based on well-established medical criteria. Refine membership functions, use real ECG data to adjust the ranges in your membership functions. The current ranges might not accurately represent real-world ECG patterns. Balance the rules, ensure that the rules are not too biased towards detecting abnormalities. There should be a clear distinction between what's considered a normal variation and what's genuinely abnormal. Medical input, if possible, get input from a medical professional specializing in ECG interpretation. They can provide valuable insights into how to set your membership functions and rules. Testing and iteration, test your system with as many real and synthetic ECG patterns as possible. Adjust your system based on the outcomes of these tests. Remember, the goal is to mimic the complex decision-making process a medical professional goes through when interpreting an ECG, which is quite challenging but definitely achievable with careful tuning and testing. Yeah. Let's get to it. To adjust all these uh, parameters. So if you were a ECG specialist, how would you adjust the membership functions and the fuzzy rules? All right, if I were an ECG specialist looking to tweak the fuzzy logic system for ECG waveform analysis, I'd focus on ensuring the membership functions and rules closely align with clinical knowledge and real-world ECG data. Here's how I'd approach it. Amplitude, rare. Real-world ECGs vary in amplitude due to numerous factors like patient size, electrode placement, etc. Low, I might consider defining low amplitude as significantly below the average ECG amplitude seen in healthy adults. Medium. This should encompass the typical range of amplitudes seen in normal ECGs. Positive and negative peaks. The number of peaks in an ECG correlates with the heart's electrical activity. Too few. This could indicate missing or weak signals, like in atrial or ventricular fibrillation. Normal. A normal ECG typically shows a set pattern of P, QRS, and T waves. Too many. Excessive peaks could indicate extra heartbeats or other abnormalities. The R peak sharpness can indicate the velocity of ventricular depolarization. Adjust the sharpness thresholds based on typical sharpness values in healthy versus diseased hearts. These intervals are crucial in diagnosing conditions like AV block, tachycardia, etc. Use clinical guidelines to define normal, short, and long intervals. Balance sensitivity and specificity. The goal is to minimize false positives and false negatives. Adjust rules to be specific enough to detect abnormalities without overflagging normal variations. Integrate clinical knowledge, incorporate rules that mirror clinical decision-making. For instance, a very short PR interval might be indicative of pre-excitation syndromes. Rule interactions, consider how different parameters interact. For example, a high amplitude with a normal R peak sharpness might still be normal, but a high amplitude with an abnormal R peak sharpness might indicate hypertrophy. Contextual awareness, in ECG interpretation, context is key. For instance, a single premature beat might not be clinically significant, but frequent premature beats are. The system should account for such nuances. Dynamic adaptation, 
ECG patterns can vary greatly among individuals. The system might need to adapt its thresholds based on demographic data, age, sex, etc., if available. Real ECG data. Test the system with a diverse set of ECG data, including both normal and pathological cases. Continuous feedback. Regularly update the system based on new clinical findings or feedback from healthcare professionals. Error analysis. For any misclassifications, analyze why the error occurred and adjust the system accordingly. Collaboration with clinicians. Work closely with cardiologists or other ECG experts to validate and improve the system. In essence, the adjustment of this system requires a tight integration of clinical knowledge, statistical analysis of ECG data, and iterative testing. It's a complex task, but with careful attention to detail and continuous refinement, the system can become a powerful tool for ECG interpretation. Okay, we do not currently have access, uh, easy access to a cardiologist or any other ECG specialist. So we will have to fine tune the parameters ourselves. Now I'm sharing a couple of images of how the waveforms uh, look like. Uh, can you rewrite the fuzzy logic analysis function? We've updated the membership functions and fuzzy rules. Include all the comments as to what changes were made. Uh, as to what changes were made. So go over each uh, membership function and each fuzzy rule. Yep. The images you've uploaded appear to be screenshots from a game interface that includes an ECG waveform and scores for both a human player and a fuzzy logic system. The scores reflect the ability to correctly identify abnormal ECG patterns. The fuzzy system seems to be overly sensitive, marking nearly all ECG segments as abnormal, hits, leading to a high number of false alarms and no correct rejections. Given the fuzzy system's tendency to classify waveforms as abnormal and your inability to consult with a cardiologist, we will need to rely on general knowledge of ECG patterns to recalibrate the membership functions and rules. Here's how we can proceed. Membership function adjustment. We should ensure that the membership functions for normal ECG features are well-defined and based on standard ECG waveform characteristics. We will adjust the ranges for amplitude, peak count, and intervals to more conservative values that better match typical ECGs. Fuzzy rules refinement. The rules will be updated to reflect a more balanced approach, preventing the system from being overly sensitive to abnormal patterns. We will implement rules that allow for normal variations in the ECG. I'll now provide a rewritten analysis function with comments to indicate changes. Since I cannot execute Python code, this will be a conceptual representation that you would need to integrate and test in your actual codebase. That would give me an error.
So we have um, quite a few rules. We have a default rule, then rules one to six, and uh, rule for abnormal intervals. Okay, it doesn't want to generate anymore. It just gave up on me. Why did you give up on me? So I have to go. Over them in the same way. We reload the page. Can we continue generating uh, the same um, analysis uh, we've suggested changes for all the rules? Yep. So let it uh, go to that. We will do So I have to go over these membership functions again. So we have amplitude, haven't changed that. Six one, haven't changed that. So I don't know why it even generated that code considering there were no changes made. Get rid of it. Now amplitude. We have low, medium, and high. Let's call it, call it normal. That's that's actually a better name. But then it will start uh, complaining. So we'll take the yeah. The problem with the current amplitude is that the oh, it really became slow because we're like at minus one hundred fifty uh, points. When the points go uh, low, it becomes uh, much slower. Yeah, ideally, we would not be looking at the signals that we have. Eventually, we want to add much more as well. But the problem with the amplitude, so we don't want to end up like fine-tuning each uh, parameter. We don't want uh, essentially to use the uh, magic numbers clear You might change the name to medium. A uh, comment that out for a sec and see essentially how good of a cardiologist a GPT-4 can be. So we have positive peaks. that positive peaks just make sure that the names are the same we have too few normal too many yeah two three peaks can be normal accounting for p and t more than three peaks might be unnormal 
uh, one positive peak is typical. Um, okay. So the thing is, it later also important like uh, once we go over the rules, it uh, makes a huge difference because we're essentially giving a weight for each uh, situation. So I might keep it. It didn't go over all of them. A big sharpness. Where is the sharpness? Let's also change the values. We keep them between 0 and 1. And this one might be a bit uh, finicky. So yeah, sharper ones are more typical. Broad range for normal R peak sharpness. Very sharp peaks may indicate abnormality. Very sharp. Yeah, we have low, normal, high. And yeah, let's try that. Abnormality. We have uh, so essentially the the output. So we have both uh, binary normal abnormal, but we also have uh, likelihood which is um, abnormality is likely possible or unlikely and it's suggesting we already have that line It's not antecedent, is it? I'm pretty sure we have that line somewhere. Yeah, so the range for abnormality is from 0 to 1.1 with uh, steps of 0.1. Get rid of it over there. Now, the rules. Well, we haven't... Uh, we didn't go over all the membership functions. Which is a bit... Uh, Forward. Membership functions. The ranges for the membership functions have been adjusted to be more conservative, reducing the likelihood of false positives. Fuzzy rules. The rules have been refined to better balance the sensitivity and specificity of the system. A new rule, Rule 5, has been added to account for cases where R peak sharpness is normal, which could indicate a normal ECG. Output decision. A decision threshold is used to categorize the ECG as normal or abnormal based on the fuzzy output. This threshold can be adjusted based on testing and validation. Implement the preprocess underscore waveform function that will extract the required features from the ECG waveform. Integrate the new fuzzy logic system into the application. Test the system with a variety of ECG waveforms to validate the performance and adjust as necessary. Continuously refine the membership functions and rules based on the test results.
this pseudocode needs to be integrated and tested within your actual application environment. It should serve as a conceptual guide for how to structure the fuzzy logic system given the constraints and goals of your ECG analysis game. We have a rule one for normal SCG considering all factors. Okay. It's a lot. I might actually keep the rules uh, proper names. This one uh, looking up should post peaks. So it's saying essentially if everything is normal, abnormality is unlikely. Okay. So we actually need to make sure this is working for our data set. Uh, in our data set, we only have uh, one uh, normal ECG type. The other ones are abnormal. Yeah, and I actually don't expect uh, it to work with the GPT-4 suggestions. So I'm not sure if it means it's not a great cardiologist or just in our case, uh, the sample data is uh, different. So I'll have to, yeah, tweak things to suit the waveforms that we are generating. So it's suggesting so there is like a, an edge cases of a, a normal ECG. So when it's always normal, when it's clearly abnormal, rule for potentially abnormal. Interestingly enough, it's not uh, even looking at the R peak uh, sharpness for being potentially abnormal. Rule for potentially abnormality based on R peak sharpness. Okay, so I take my comment back. It actually has a separate rule uh, for R peak uh, sharpness. And rule five incorporating R peak sharpness being normal. Should normal positive peaks normal? How's it rule five different from rule one? Does rule one doesn't have our peak sharpness? No, it does seem to be. Rule one has everything as the uh, and uh, operators, rule five has and and then or um, which can make sense but then the description is not right It's also decided to rewrite the analyze ECG function, which we didn't actually ask for. Do we even have it? We have something. Right, well, currently it's in the same function. I think it's uh, suggesting to split. Yeah, because currently the fuzzy logic analysis is like way too long. So it refracted it into two parts. Do we have a calculate membership?
Yeah, as it said, it's a pseudo pseudo code, so it's not quite relevant to the code we provided. Interesting breaking down. What we currently have would not even work. Yes, something broke the code. Too many doesn't exist. So I have low, medium, high for amplitude. We do have too few, normal, too many. Positive peaks. It's not too many, we had too many before and it used to work. What? It's wrong, isn't it? Did it do a mistake? Yes, it did. No, I don't trust it. Made a mistake there as well. I think that number meant to be six instead of five. Because we can make it five over there. Yeah, that one should have been uh, labeled as normal. Well, that's because of the noise. We have like 29 positive peaks. That's not right. So let's reduce the noise to zero. That's abnormal. That's correct. Let's just wait for a normal. That's abnormal. Correct. 0.7. That's abnormal. Correct. 0.6. And what do we get for a normal one? And for normal, we get 0.59. Yeah, 0 0.6 bar, 0.59 is the normal one. Yeah, there's not much uh, difference between them, that's the problem. And we get 0 0.59 for another uh, abnormal anyway, so that, that's no good. Yeah, I have to modify the rules quite a bit. Yeah, and I guess an error like that means that uh, for some conditions there were like no rules, uh, met, no rules were met at all, even though we have a default rule. So I have to check what that error is all about. Yeah. 
Yeah, the other way gives those rules some proper names. Yeah, I like it. Wait, it's the four. Did we have more rules just a second ago? All right, yeah, we do. So we have five rules instead of the whatever the seven that we have. Uh, we are happy to try them out. We have five rules. And why do we need this analyze? The ECG is not being used. It's just suggesting to split uh, the function. It kind of makes sense because it's too long. The abnormality analysis. Yeah, the decision is not good. That shouldn't be a result uh, below a certain number. That's what we have the membership functions for. Just the normal. Does it tell you from which? I remember which one was it. Uh, was this uh, medium for amplitude? Oops. Let's forget Control Shift C instead of Control C alone. That helps. Leave it for a sec. Mm. 
Yeah, we should have the uh, interval was the problem. Oops. Okay, control shift C. I don't know where this air is coming from. I don't know. Uh, okay, might might be going in circles now. Anyway, we need to fix those the uh, membership functions. So hopefully, we can do it later today or tomorrow. I'll see you next time. Bye. It looks like there's an error occurring during the processing of PR underscore interval in the analyze underscore waveform function. The error message, unexpected input, PR underscore interval, suggests that there may be a mismatch in what the fuzzy logic system expects as inputs for the PR interval. Here are some steps and code modifications to handle this issue. Ensure input normalization. Check that the PR and RT intervals are normalized correctly and are within the range expected by the fuzzy logic system. Handle undefined values. If the PR or RT interval cannot be calculated, ensure that your fuzzy logic system can handle undefined or none values gracefully. Error handling. Enhance error handling in the analyze underscore waveform function to provide more informative messages when something goes wrong. Here's a revised version of the relevant parts of the analyze underscore waveform function with these considerations. In the fuzzy underscore logic underscore analysis function, you should add appropriate checks to handle the case when the PR and RT intervals are none or zero, which can happen if they're undefined. These changes aim to handle unexpected or undefined inputs in a manner that prevents errors and allows the fuzzy logic system to continue operating, potentially with default values. The normalization function ensures that the intervals are scaled to the range expected by the fuzzy system, preventing out-of-bounds errors.
In the fuzzy underscore logic underscore analysis function, you should add appropriate checks to handle the case when the PR and RT intervals are none or zero, which can happen if they are undefined. These changes aim to handle unexpected or undefined inputs in a manner that prevents errors and allows the fuzzy logic system to continue operating, potentially with default values. The normalization function ensures that the intervals are scaled to the range expected by the fuzzy system, preventing out-of-bounds errors. Okay, it started uh, happening, the error started happening after changing the membership functions, after changing the fuzzy logic analysis. Can we again go over each uh, membership function one by one? Uh, suggest the uh, default values and then uh, we go over the fuzzy rules as well one by one of what we currently have so if you can uh, act as a cardiologist that would be great um, so you should be agnostic to what the waveforms actually look like and uh, we want to generate general uh, membership functions and uh, activation rules for the fuzzy logic um, Yep. Sure, let's tackle the fuzzy logic membership functions and rules as if I were a cardiologist, setting default values and rules based on general knowledge of ECG characteristics. Amplitude, asterisk. Low, normally, ECG amplitude is not very low unless there is poor electrode contact or the patient has a low voltage ECG, which is rare. We will set this to cover a very small portion of the range. Medium, this should cover the typical range for an ECG, which is what we expect in most healthy adults. High. A high amplitude might indicate ventricular hypertrophy or other conditions, so we'll set a range that captures significantly higher than normal values. Positive peaks, asterisk. Too few, in a typical ECG, there should be one R wave per cardiac cycle. If there are less, it could indicate a serious condition. Normal, one positive peak per cycle is normal, which is the R wave. Too many, more than one R wave may indicate conditions like ventricular tachycardia. 
negative peaks. Too few, negative peaks are less common and their absence might not always indicate an abnormality. Normal, normally, we don't expect to see many negative peaks, so we'll set a conservative range. Too many, multiple negative peaks could indicate an inverted T wave or an abnormal Q wave. R peak sharpness, asterisk. Low, an R wave that is too broad might indicate a conduction delay. Normal, a normal R wave will have a certain sharpness that corresponds to a healthy heart's conduction speed. High, a very sharp R wave could indicate a hyperacute myocardial infarction. Rule for normal ECG, I. If the amplitude is medium, positive peaks are normal, negative peaks are normal, and R peak sharpness is normal, then the ECG is likely normal. Rule for clearly abnormal ECG, if. If amplitude is high or low, or if there are too many positive or negative peaks, then the ECG is likely abnormal. Rule for potentially abnormal ECG, if. If there are too few positive or negative peaks or the R peak sharpness is abnormal, then the ECG might be abnormal.
If there are too few positive or negative peaks or the R peak sharpness is abnormal, then the ECG might be abnormal. Certainly. Let's define each membership function and corresponding fuzzy rule, assuming a general understanding of ECG characteristics with our specific waveform visuals. The goal is to create a fuzzy logic system that can generalize well over typical ECG features. Amplitude, asterisk. Low, uncommon in healthy ECGs and could indicate technical issues or specific medical conditions. Medium, represents the amplitude range typically observed in a healthy population. High, significantly above the normal range, possibly indicating cardiac hypertrophy or other abnormalities. Positive peaks, e.g., R waves, asterisk. Too few, less than one positive peak might be due to a rare arrhythmia or an error in ECG recording. Normal, typically, one positive R wave per cardiac cycle is expected. Too many, more than one positive peak could indicate extra systoles or other forms of arrhythmia. Negative peaks, asterisk. Too few may be normal as negative peaks are less common, e.g., Q waves. Normal, typically, 0 to 1 negative peak is expected per cycle. Too many, more negative peaks can suggest ischemia or infarction. R peak sharpness, asterisk. Low, indicates a less sharp R wave, which could be due to a conduction delay. Normal, a sharp R wave is typical of a normal ECG. High, extremely sharp R waves could be pathological. Normal ECG rule, if. If the amplitude is medium, and both positive and negative peaks are within normal ranges, then the R wave sharpness is normal, the ECG is likely normal. Abnormal ECG rule, if. If the amplitude is very high or very low, or if there are too many positive or negative peaks, the ECG is likely abnormal. Potentially abnormal ECG rule, if. If there are too few positive or negative peaks, or if the R wave sharpness is high or low, the ECG might be abnormal. These rules and membership functions should create a balanced fuzzy logic system that can distinguish between normal and abnormal ECG patterns with reasonable accuracy. Remember, the exact range is for
Certainly, let's clarify the fuzzy rules and address the error you're encountering. We're suggesting a set of rules that can make educated guesses about the normality or potential abnormality of an ECG pattern based on a general understanding of ECG characteristics. Rule for normal ECG, rule underscore normal, if. If the amplitude is either too high or too low, or if there are too many positive or negative peaks, then we assume the ECG is likely abnormal. If there are too few positive or negative peaks, or if the R peak sharpness is not normal, either too high or too low, then we consider the ECG possibly abnormal. We can certainly define additional rules if needed, especially if there are specific combinations of these features that are known to be indicative of certain conditions. However, the three rules above provide a basic structure for the fuzzy logic analysis. The error message error in analyze underscore waveform, unexpected input, PR underscore interval suggests that the fuzzy logic system is receiving an input for the PR interval that it doesn't expect or can't handle properly. This could happen if the PR interval value is outside the expected range defined for the fuzzy variable. The PR interval variable is not properly set up in the fuzzy system. Here's how we can troubleshoot and fix it. Ensure the PR interval is within the expected range. Make Make sure that the PR interval is normalized correctly within the range, 0, 1, as defined by the membership functions. The fuzzy system might not know how to handle, undefined, or none. It's better to set a default value that the system can interpret, such as 0 or a value within the normal range. Verify that the PR interval is properly defined as an input in the fuzzy control system. Here's a code snippet to handle none values and ensure the PR interval is within the expected range. Make sure to apply similar logic for the RT interval and any other inputs to the fuzzy system. The goal is to ensure all inputs are within the expected ranges and that none or undefined values are handled gracefully. The error, unexpected input, PR underscore interval, suggests there might be an issue with the values being passed to the PR underscore interval antecedent in the fuzzy control system. This could be because the value is outside the defined range, or it might be a non-numeric value like, undefined. Given that the range for PR underscore interval is defined between 0 and 0 0.21, ensure that all inputs to this antecedent are numeric and fall within this range. The undefined value must be converted to a numeric value that the fuzzy system can handle. Here's how you could modify the PR underscore interval and RT underscore interval antecedents to include handling of undefined values. When setting up the system, ensure that you handle undefined intervals by setting them to a default value within the defined range. For example, you could decide that an undefined PR interval should be treated as a no No, I think the PR and RT interval should be between 0 and 1. But, uh, yes, we might want to double check that. And also for certain waveforms, I get them both as undefined. Yep.
All right, if the PR and RT intervals should be between 0 and 1, then the membership functions for the PR and RT intervals need to be adjusted to reflect this range. This also means that when you get a value of undefined for these intervals, the system should handle it by assigning a default value that falls within this range. Here's how you can adjust the PR underscore interval and RT underscore interval definitions and handle undefined values. In the fuzzy logic analysis function, you'll need to handle undefined values for PR and RT intervals. A common approach is to treat undefined as the midpoint of the normal range or as a neutral value. It's important to normalize the actual PR and RT interval values to be between 0 and 1 before setting them to the fuzzy control system. If the intervals are measured in seconds or any other unit, you need to find a way to convert them to a 0 to 1 scale that matches the membership functions. If an interval is undefined, you assign the default underscore normal underscore value which is a neutral value within the normal range. This way, the fuzzy system can handle all cases consistently. To address the issue of the unexpected input PR underscore interval error, let's ensure that the input for the PR and RT intervals is correctly handled. It seems that when the interval values are undefined, it's not being processed properly by the fuzzy logic system, which expects a numeric value. Here's a step-by-step -step approach to resolve this. Make sure that the input ranges for PR underscore interval and RT underscore interval cover all possible numeric values as you set them between 0 and 1. When you receive undefined for PR and RT intervals, you should decide on a default numeric value to use. Since these are ratios, a safe default might be the midpoint of the normal range. In the code where you input the PR underscore interval and RT underscore interval into the fuzzy system, handle the undefined case by assigning the default value. Here is an updated version of your analyze underscore waveform and related functions to include these changes. In the fuzzy underscore logic underscore analysis function, we're making sure that the PR and RT interval values are within the expected range, 0, 1, by clamping them using max and min functions. If the intervals are undefined, they have already been replaced with a default value of 0 0.5 in the analyze underscore waveform function. Also, ensure that your membership function ranges for PR underscore interval and RT underscore interval reflect this 0, 1 range in the definitions. The error message suggests that there's an input that the system doesn't expect, and this change ensures that the system will always receive a valid numeric input. Run the application with these changes, and the unexpected input error should be resolved. If the error persists, there might be additional issues elsewhere in the code where the PR and RT intervals are being used. The error, unexpected input, PR underscore interval, 
suggests that the fuzzy logic system may not be properly configured to accept PR underscore interval as an input, or there is an issue with how the value is being passed to it. Here's a checklist to troubleshoot this issue. Verify antecedent setup. Ensure the PR underscore interval is correctly set up as an antecedent in the fuzzy logic system with appropriate membership functions. Check input range. Confirm that the input range for PR underscore interval matches the domain of the input data. Validate input. Before passing the PR underscore interval to the fuzzy logic system, validate that it is within the expected numeric range. Debug print statements. Place print statements before the line where the fuzzy logic system receives the PR underscore interval input to confirm that the input is as expected. Update fuzzy system inputs. If PR underscore interval or RT underscore interval are not used in the rules, the fuzzy system may throw an error. Ensure that each input variable is involved in at least one rule. Check data types. Ensure that the data types of all inputs to the fuzzy system are floats, which are expected by the system. Python is strict about types, and passing an incorrect type, like a string representation of a number, can cause errors. Here is a code example with validation and debug print statements added. Make sure that the validate underscore interval function is called before the values are passed to fuzzy underscore logic underscore analysis, and that the function itself is correctly receiving these values as parameters. The debug print statement will help confirm that the values are correct just before the fuzzy logic system uses them. If the error persists even with numerical values, there might be a deeper issue. Consider simplifying the fuzzy system to the minimum working example with PR underscore interval and then build it up step by step, testing at each step to identify where the issue arises. Certainly, let's expand the fuzzy rules to include all the variables, amplitude, positive peaks, negative peaks, R peak sharpness, PR interval, and RT interval. Integrating all these variables will make the fuzzy logic system more comprehensive and potentially more accurate in its analysis. Rule for normal ECG, if the If the amplitude is very high or very low, or there are too many positive or negative peaks, the ECG is likely abnormal. If the R peak sharpness is either too high or too low, the ECG might be abnormal. If either PR or RT interval is too short or too long, the ECG is likely abnormal. Rule for mixed indicators, combining various factors. If there are multiple indicators of abnormality, e.g., abnormal amplitude with abnormal peak counts, or abnormal intervals with abnormal peak sharpness, the ECG is likely abnormal. Let's implement these rules. These rules consider various combinations of ECG features to provide a comprehensive analysis. The rule underscore normal is designed to capture cases where all ECG features fall within the normal ranges. The other rules address different combinations of abnormalities, thereby covering a broad spectrum of potential ECG patterns. This setup should improve the ability of the system to classify ECG patterns accurately. Let me know if there are any questions, especially if you tried bionicchaos.com. That would be awesome if you provide your feedback. This is what we are here for. And the tools that we're currently developing are coming up on the website shortly as well. But there's plenty to check out so far.
these rules consider various combinations of ECG features to provide a comprehensive analysis. The rule underscore normal is designed to capture cases where all ECG features fall within the normal ranges. The other rules address different combinations of abnormalities, thereby covering a broad spectrum of potential ECG patterns. This setup should improve the ability of the system to classify ECG patterns accurately. The issue you're experiencing, as indicated by the error message you func, less, did not contain a loop with signature matching types, less than class, numpy, d types, float 64 d type, greater than, less than class, numpy, d types, str d type, greater than, to none, seems to be related to how your app. seems to be related to how your application handles the undefined values for PR and RT intervals. When these intervals are undefined, your application is probably trying to perform a comparison or operation that's not valid with the undefined string. To address this, you need to modify the handling of undefined intervals within your fuzzy logic analysis. Here's a suggestion on how you might adjust your code to handle these cases. Adjust the input handling. When PR or RT intervals are undefined, you should set a default value or handle them differently in the fuzzy logic system. Update the fuzzy logic analysis function. Before passing the intervals to the fuzzy logic analysis, check if they are undefined. If they are, handle them accordingly. In this modified version, if PR underscore interval or RT underscore interval is undefined, the default value, e.g. 0.5, is used. This way, the fuzzy logic system always receives a numerical input, avoiding the type mismatch error. Remember, this is a workaround. In a real-world application, you'd want a more sophisticated approach to handle missing or undefined data, possibly involving consultation with domain experts, like cardiologists, to determine the best course of action.
Understood. If the PR and RT intervals should always output a number, but you're facing issues when there aren't enough peaks to calculate these intervals, we should revise the calculate underscore intervals function. This function needs to handle cases where there are not enough peaks to calculate PR and RT intervals reliably. Given that we are analyzing individual PQRS complexes and not a continuous waveform, the approach for calculating PR and RT intervals needs to account for different scenarios, like when certain peaks are missing. Here's a revised. Handle missing peaks. If the necessary peaks for calculating PR or RT intervals are missing, calculate these intervals based on available data or default to a certain value that indicates an incomplete waveform. Fallback values. When specific peaks are not found, use fallback values that make sense in the context of an ECG analysis. For example, if the R peak is missing, we might assume a default position based on the length of the waveform. Here's a modification of the calculate underscore intervals function to reflect this. In this revised function, we estimate intervals based on the number of detected peaks. If there are two peaks, we assume there are R and T and estimate the PP. If there are fewer than two peaks, we use a default value. This approach ensures that the function always returns numerical values, preventing errors due to undefined values. Remember, these are approximations. In real-world applications, it's crucial to validate such assumptions and fallback strategies with domain experts.
All right, wearing my virtual cardiologist hat here, let's dive into how this application can be a game changer in the medical field, particularly in training medical students, while also keeping an eye on necessary disclaimers. Practical understanding of ECG analysis. This tool is like a digital sandbox. It allows students to explore ECG waveforms in a controlled environment. They can input different waveforms and see how changes in peaks, intervals, and amplitude affect the fuzzy logic analysis. It's hands-on learning without the risk. Demonstrating the role of AI in medicine, the app showcases how AI can assist in medical diagnostics. It's not just about learning to read an ECG, it's about understanding how technology can augment human skills. This is crucial in an era where tech and medicine are increasingly intertwined. Developing critical thinking, by observing how the fuzzy logic rules apply to various waveforms, students learn to think critically about ECG interpretations. They get to see that diagnosis is not always black and white, sometimes, it's fuzzy, pun intended. Research and improvement, for those budding Einsteins in the medical class, this tool can be a research platform. They can experiment with different membership functions and rules, seeing firsthand how tweaks can improve or impair diagnostic accuracy. Disclaimers, not a replacement for professional advice. Big flashing lights here, this tool doesn't replace a seasoned cardiologist's expertise. It's an educational aid, not a diagnostic oracle. Always consult real-life experts for clinical decisions. Approximations and assumptions, the app makes certain assumptions, like estimating missing peaks. These are educated guesses, not gospel truths. In the real world, each ECG is as unique as a fingerprint and needs human interpretation. Results may vary. The fuzzy logic is based on predefined rules and thresholds, which might not cover all the wild, wonderful variations of human heart rhythms. It's good, but it's not infallible. Constantly evolving, medicine and technology are fast-paced fields. What's cutting edge today might be old news tomorrow. This tool is a snapshot of current knowledge and technology, not the final frontier. Remember, using this tool doesn't automatically grant you the title, cardiologist. You still need to endure countless coffee-fueled nights and survive the wrath of attending physicians. This app is like training wheels for ECG analysis. It helps you stay upright, but eventually, you'll have to pedal the complex world of cardiology on your own. While the app can crunch numbers and analyze waveforms, it can't empathize with patients or laugh at your jokes, that's your job. In summary, this application is a fantastic educational tool that brings a taste of AI's potential in medicine to the classroom. It's about blending technology with traditional learning, encouraging students to think critically and creatively. Just remember, it's a stepping stone, not the entire journey. I see you've uploaded several ECG trace images with corresponding scores and analysis details, including PR and RT intervals. Here's what might be going on with the PR and RT interval calculations. PR interval calculation. The PR interval is measured from the start of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. If the application is only detecting peaks and not differentiating between P waves, QRS complexes, and T waves, it might inaccurately calculate the interval. For example, if the first peak is assumed to be a P wave when it's actually part of the QRS complex, this would result in an incorrect PR interval. RT interval calculation. Similarly, the RT interval calculation requires identifying the R wave and the subsequent T wave. If the peak detection algorithm is not accurately identifying these specific waves, the RT interval will be off. Peak detection sensitivity. The algorithm might not be sensitive enough to detect all peaks, especially if they're small or if the ECG is noisy. This could lead to missing P or T waves, resulting in undefined intervals. Resolution and scaling. If the ECG data is not properly scaled to the actual time units, the intervals calculated could be inaccurate. Make sure that the data's time resolution, samples per second, matches the scaling used in interval calculation. Algorithm robustness. The algorithm might not be robust against noise or artifacts in the ECG trace. This could lead to false peaks or missed peaks, skewing the PR and RT intervals. Here are some steps to potentially improve the PR and RT interval calculations. Implement a more sophisticated peak detection algorithm that can differentiate between P waves, QRS complexes, and T waves. Increase the algorithm's sensitivity to low amplitude waves while filtering out noise. Ensure that the data scaling in terms of time is accurate. 
validate the algorithm against known ECG traces with annotated P, QIS, and T waves to fine tune the detection parameters. The application's diagnostic conclusions should always be reviewed by a qualified healthcare professional, and this software should only be used as a supplementary tool, not a definitive diagnostic system. When training medical students, emphasize the importance of understanding ECG waveform anatomy and not solely relying on automated tools. Additionally, make clear that while the tool can aid in education and pattern recognition, it does not replace the expertise of a cardiologist. Let's get into it now. To address the issues with the PR and RT interval calculations, we need to ensure that the peaks detected correspond to the correct P, QIS, and T waves. The intervals are calculated only when the necessary waves are identified. The undefined output is handled correctly. Here's an approach to refine the calculation of PR and RT intervals. Based on your description, it looks like the PR and RT intervals are being normalized twice, which would indeed make the values smaller than they should be. The normalization should only occur once. It seems we're normalizing the intervals both inside the process underscore data function and again in the calculate underscore intervals function. Let's fix the code to normalize only once and ensure the intervals are properly calculated. 
I'll update the calculate underscore intervals function to only calculate the intervals without normalizing, and we'll remove the normalization step from process underscore data. This way, we prevent double normalization. Here's the corrected calculate underscore intervals and process underscore data functions. Now, process underscore data will return none for the PR and RT intervals if they can't be calculated, which is fine for the fuzzy logic analysis as long as it expects to handle none values. Make sure that the fuzzy logic analysis can handle these cases. Remember to test your application after these changes to ensure everything is working as expected. If none values are not handled correctly in the fuzzy logic analysis, you might need to set default values or adjust the fuzzy rules to account for missing data. Now, process underscore data will return none for the PR and RT intervals if they can't be calculated, which is fine for the fuzzy logic analysis as long as it expects to handle none values. Make sure that the fuzzy logic analysis can handle these cases. Remember to test your application after these changes to ensure everything is working as expected. If none values are not handled correctly in the fuzzy logic analysis, you might need to set default values or adjust the fuzzy rules to account for missing data. Apologies for any confusion. Let's clarify. Normalization should be performed once, but it should be done in the right place. If the PR and RT intervals are used in the fuzzy logic analysis and need to be normalized, which is typical, as you want your input variables to be in the same scale, this should be done just before they're fed into the fuzzy system. The change I suggested was to remove the normalization from the calculate underscore intervals function, because it seemed like they were being normalized again in the process underscore data function. However, if they're not normalized in process underscore data, then we should indeed keep the normalization step in calculate underscore intervals. Let's correct that. We'll calculate the PR and RT intervals in calculate underscore intervals, normalize them, and return the normalized values. The process underscore data function then just passes these values through, so it doesn't need to normalize them again. Make sure to adjust your fuzzy logic analysis to appropriately handle none values for these intervals if they're not present. If the fuzzy logic system does not handle none values, you may need to implement a strategy to handle these cases, such as setting default values or adjusting the membership functions and rules. The process underscore data function then just passes these values through, so it doesn't need to normalize them again.
Let's go over the issues you're encountering with the PR and RT interval calculations and the fuzzy logic decision-making process. PR and RT interval calculation. The PR and RT intervals are ratios that represent time intervals in an ECG waveform. You've normalized these intervals by the length of the waveform, which is a standard approach to make the interval scale invariant. However, if you're seeing values that are too small or not making sense, it could be due to incorrect peak detection or improper handling of cases where the expected number of peaks is not found. The membership functions or the ranges for normal might not be appropriately defined. The rules may not be comprehensive or correctly prioritized to cover all normal cases effectively. There might be an issue with the inputs being provided to the fuzzy logic system, perhaps due to incorrect data processing or normalization. To correct the code and improve the algorithm's accuracy, consider the following steps. Review peak detection logic. Ensure that the peak detection is robust and can accurately identify P, QRS, and T peaks in various conditions. Investigate any assumptions made, such as the order of the peaks, and consider more sophisticated ECG feature detection algorithms if necessary. Adjust membership functions. If your membership functions for normal intervals are too restrictive, they might not cover all variations of a normal ECG. Re-evaluate these functions and adjust the universe of discourse and the shapes accordingly. Examine fuzzy rules. If the rules are too simplistic or not correctly weighted, the system might not differentiate between normal and abnormal effectively. You may need to add more rules or adjust the existing ones to account for a broader range of scenarios. Double-check normalization. If you remove the normalization step, make sure that the raw values you're now using are appropriate for the fuzzy logic system. If normalization is necessary, it should be done consistently and correctly across all data points. Debugging. Implement a debugging mechanism to trace how the inputs are processed through the fuzzy system and which rules are being triggered for a given output. This can help identify where the system is failing. For the ECG waveforms that are misclassified, you would need to look at the values of each fuzzy variable for that waveform and see which rules are being activated. It could be that the membership functions for the normal range are not capturing the values correctly or that the rules need to be adjusted to better handle the edge cases. Without a detailed look at the exact values being fed into the fuzzy system and the logic of the rules, it's challenging to pinpoint the exact issue. However, the suggestions above should give you a structured approach to debugging and improving the system. If after these steps the problem persists, you may need to share more specifics about the misclassified cases and the logic of the fuzzy system for a deeper analysis.
The abnormality score in a fuzzy logic system is determined by evaluating the input parameters against a set of fuzzy rules and then aggregating the results to produce a final score. The specific score will depend on the rules you've established and the membership functions that define the categories for each input variable. Negative peaks, 1. Raw amplitude, 0 0.583285152743106. R peak sharpness, 0 0.4166666666666667. PR interval, normalized, 0.3. RT interval, normalized, 0.3. We would need to evaluate these against your fuzzy rules. Since I don't have the ability to run your fuzzy logic engine directly or the specific details of the membership functions and rules, I can't calculate the exact abnormality score for you. However, in a typical fuzzy logic system, you would do the following. For each input variable, determine the degree of membership in each of the corresponding fuzzy sets. For example, if positive peaks of 3 falls mostly in the normal fuzzy set, but slightly in the too many set, you would have membership degrees for each of those sets. Apply the fuzzy rules to degrees of membership. For example, if you have a rule that says, if positive peaks is normal and raw amplitude is medium, then abnormality is unlikely, you will take the minimum membership degree of the normal set for positive peaks and the medium set for raw amplitude as the strength of the rule. Combine the rule outputs according to their assigned consequent fuzzy sets for the output variable, abnormality. This is typically done using methods like max min composition or max product composition. Defuzzify the combined output fuzzy set to yield a single number. The defuzzification method often used is the centroid or center of gravity method, which finds the balance point of the output fuzzy set. For a precise abnormality score, you would follow these steps using your fuzzy logic control systems API or tool. If you need to implement this manually or in another environment, you would need to replicate the functionality of your current fuzzy logic system according to its design. The membership functions for the positive peaks in a fuzzy logic system are used to categorize the number of positive peaks in an ECG signal into linguistic terms such as too few, normal, or too many. These are usually defined using triangular or trapezoidal shapes, but other shapes like Gaussian or sigmoidal can also be used depending on the system's design. Here's how you might define triangular membership functions for positive peaks based on the universe of discourse, the range of possible values for positive peaks, which I'll assume to be between 0 and 6. In this example, we're assuming that too few is defined as anywhere from 0 to 2 peaks. Normal is defined precisely at 1 peak, but with a range that allows some flexibility, from 1 to 3 peaks. Too many is defined as more than 2 peaks, with the range extending to the maximum expected number of peaks. The exact numbers used for these membership functions should be based on clinical data and expert knowledge. They will determine the sensitivity and specificity of the fuzzy logic system in identifying normal and abnormal ECG patterns. If more precise or nuanced categorization is needed, you can add more linguistic variables or adjust the shapes and ranges of these functions.
In defining membership functions for ECG signal analysis, using Gaussian or generalized bell-shaped functions can provide a natural representation of the data. Gaussian functions are characterized by their mean and spread, while generalized bell-shaped functions are flexible and can create a variety of shapes based on their parameters. Sigmoid functions, which are often used in machine learning, could also be considered, as they smoothly map the input between 0 and 1 and are defined by their slope at a specific point. However, these functions have a mathematical complexity that might not always be suitable for real-time analysis or systems with computational limitations. The choice of membership functions should balance accuracy in representing the data with the system's ability to process the information efficiently. For detailed guidance on fuzzy membership functions, you can refer to educational resources that explain these concepts in depth.
The error message you're getting indicates that there's an issue with the rule set in your fuzzy logic system not covering the input space adequately. This means that there are some combinations of input variables that are not triggering any rules, leading to an inability to calculate a crisp output. Here are a few steps to troubleshoot and potentially resolve this issue. Rule coverage. Ensure that your rules cover the entire input space. There should be at least one rule that will fire for any possible combination of inputs. Membership function overlaps. Check your membership functions for each antecedent. They should overlap to some extent to avoid gaps in the logic where no rules would fire. Default rule. Consider implementing a default rule that will fire if no other rules do. This can be a catch-all rule with less weight that provides a default action in case of sparse inputs. Rule adjustment. Adjust the existing rules to be less restrictive. If they are too specific, they might not apply to a wide enough range of input scenarios. Input validation. Validate the input values to ensure they are within the expected range. It's possible that inputs are not being scaled or normalized correctly before being fed into the fuzzy logic system. System testing. Test your fuzzy system with a wide range of input values to ensure robustness and to identify any input combinations that don't trigger a rule. Debugging information. Print out which rules are firing for given inputs during testing to understand better why certain inputs are not producing a crisp output. After making these checks, if you're still facing issues, you might want to consider consulting a fuzzy logic expert who can look into your specific implementation in detail. Sure, let's start by examining the membership functions. Membership functions define how each point in the input space is mapped to a membership value between 0 and 1 for each fuzzy set. It's crucial that these functions are defined correctly to ensure the system's reliability. Short, defined with a trim from 0 to 0 0.30. This means any PR interval from 0 to 0 0.30 is considered short. Normal, overlaps with short and long, from 0 0.30 to 0 0.99. A value around 0 0.66 would be considered completely normal. Long starts overlapping with normal around 0 0.66 and goes to 1. Short, similar to PR, defined from 0 to 0 0.30. Normal overlaps with short and long from 0 0.30 to 0 0.99. Long starts overlapping with normal around 0 0.66 and goes to 1. Low from 0 to 0 0.3. Normal. Overlaps with low and high, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. High, starts overlapping with normal around 0 0.7 and goes to 1. For the positive peaks and negative peaks, the membership functions were initially defined with specific ranges that cover from 0 peaks to a maximum number, 5 for positive, 4 for negative. It's important to ensure these ranges reflect realistic counts of peaks that can occur in an ECG waveform. Low, defined from 0 to 0 0.1. Medium. A broad range from 0.05 to 0.95, covering most of the possible amplitude values. High, from 0.9 to 1, overlapping with medium. Now, let's move on to the rules. Rule normal. This rule states that if everything is classified as normal, the ECG is likely normal. This is a straightforward rule, but it might be too restrictive if all conditions need to be normal for it to fire. Rule abnormal amplitude peaks. This rule says that if the amplitude is too high or low, or if there are too many peaks, the ECG is likely abnormal. This seems to make sense, as extreme values in these categories often indicate abnormalities. Rule potential abnormal sharpness. If the R peak sharpness is too high or too low, it indicates a possible abnormality. This is a good rule, assuming that extreme sharpness values are uncommon. Rule abnormal intervals. 
This focuses on the lengths of PR and RT intervals, marking the ECG as likely abnormal if they're too short or too long. It's crucial that these are set correctly according to clinical standards. Rule mixed indicators. This rule appears to catch mixed signals from the inputs. If there are conflicting indicators from different inputs, it marks the ECG as likely abnormal. However, this rule could be too complex, leading to potential issues if it's trying to cover too much. It's important that these rules are not contradicting each other and that they cover all possible scenarios. Each input should have a path through the rules that leads to an output, avoiding the situation where no rules are triggered. All right, to adjust the fuzzy logic system to consider an ECG waveform with the given parameters as normal, we can tweak the membership functions like this. Positive peaks, asterisk. Too few, keep current from zero to around two. Normal, adjust this range to include three as a strong member, so maybe from two to four. Too many, adjust this range to start higher than four. Negative peaks. Too few, keep current from zero to around 0 0.5. Normal. Adjust this range to include 1 as a strong member, so maybe from 0.5 to 1.5. Too many. Adjust this range to start higher than 1.5. Amplitude. Low. Keep current from 0 to around 0 0.1. Medium. Broaden this to include 0.58 as a strong member, so maybe adjust to 0 0.1 to 0 0.7. High. Adjust to start around 0 0.7. Low. Maybe 0 to 0 0.3. Normal. Broaden this range to strongly include 0 0.416, so perhaps 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. High, adjust to start around 0 0.7. Short, keep current from 0 to around 0 0.2. Normal, adjust this to include 0 0.3 as a strong member, so maybe 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. Long, adjust this range to start higher than 0 0.4. After making these adjustments, you'll want to validate the new setup by testing it with a variety of known ECG waveforms to ensure that it still correctly identifies abnormal patterns when they are present. You should also consider consulting with domain experts to validate the clinical relevance of these ranges. Certainly. Based on the guidelines we discussed, here is how you could modify the fuzzy logic definitions in your Python code to potentially classify a normal ECG waveform with your specified values as normal. Make sure to test the updated system thoroughly to ensure that it behaves as expected across a range of input values. This is a starting point, and fine-tuning may be required to achieve the desired specificity and sensitivity.
Okay, we actually might be in business. It's now uh, not making any mistakes. It did one uh, false alarm. But that's pretty much it. It's not uh, detecting the normal ECG waveform as abnormal, which is good. But we kind of faked it with all the um, a GPT-4 to adjust the membership functions to to actually make sure that the specific abnormal ECG waveform that we have does not uh, would not be labeled as uh, abnormal so will be always labeled as normal so it adjusted the membership functions obviously the question is um, how well will it work once we add the uh, more uh, waveforms that's what we want to see and also well currently already as it is we can uh, see how oops that's me making yeah so i'll start making mistakes the bot will be winning and this is the no noise uh, scenario they can start adding some noise see what happens The hypothesis obviously will be that uh, the robot will start uh, making mistakes as you increase the noise level. Um, I can't compete with it already, so obviously it does the same task as the uh, I am. It gets the raw a waveform values it doesn't have the labels and it's able to classify correctly this one here or something somewhere we'll check the log the terminal in a sec but this is it i can't do it anymore at around the i think i can push to 1000 a score but the port We'll just uh, uh, we'll keep uh, going correctly forever. No breaks, no food, no pay. It just goes. Well, it just pay for electricity, right? But how much humans gobble up electricity? Anyway, I'm, I'm Dansky, I can't do it anymore. The bot will keep going. And obviously it doesn't care about speed as well. It uh, does the uh, decision instantaneously. Oops, and I'm making mistakes already. Yeah, maybe I can buy really push it i can get to a thousand then it will be really hard for me to keep it there it's the other thing so it's the long longer term uh, performance that will suffer if i keep uh, doing the task because if i stop clicking i think the pretty sure the score will start uh, going uh, down so I'm making a lot of uh, misses already well, because it's too fast for me and the bot is going strong. And uh, in our case, uh, in this uh, session, the GPT acted as a cardiologist. Well, fake, obviously fake cardiologist. Yeah, it did provide disclaimers. You can, uh, you know, see prior and uh, was able to tune up the parameters for the algorithm to to do the classification properly so i don't know where that uh, one false alarm came from ah i'm pretty sure it came uh, from uh, where we had the noise in the signal uh, because the default option when you load the page uh, there is noise 
uh, introduced. Yeah, so it will be interesting to see now what uh, will happen once we start introducing noise to the system. So just introduce just a tiny bit. Uh, yeah, and now false alarm. Yeah, I'm not sure which one is it uh, not uh, doing correctly, but yes, there's essentially too many positive peaks so it's uh, messing up the numbers there's no filter at the moment there, was, uh, there would be probably a simple filter would uh, solve this I didn't want to filter um, so that the human and the bot essentially look at the same waveform so the bot doesn't have any unfair advantage Yeah, so now it's actually uh, classifying everything as abnormal, so including the normal waveform. That's why the false alarm rate uh, going up. We have, what if we have just the tiniest amount of uh, noise? No, it still gets. Uh, triggered somehow it's not why Yeah, this is where it starts uh, picking up uh, errors. So that's not great. Anyway, we'll continue next time. See you in a bit. Hey, can you summarize what we did today and say bye-bye to the viewers politely? Yep. Today, we've tackled the complex task of fine-tuning a fuzzy logic system to analyze ECG waveforms. We adjusted membership functions specifically to ensure a particular normal ECG waveform wouldn't be misclassified as abnormal. This approach helped reduce false alarms significantly in a noise-free environment, which is a great start. We also touched on the potential for the system's performance as we introduced noise and more varied data, hypothesizing that while a human might struggle with increased noise levels, the bot could potentially maintain high accuracy due to its consistent, tireless analytical capability. It's a wrap for today's session. We've made solid progress, and it's exciting to think about the potential of this system as it gets exposed to more data and scenarios. Goodbye for now, and take care.